It was a great occasion. It was the, the Crow Park is just it's it's a sensational stadium. My own memory started to flood back really about when I saw the two sides going. Uh, 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 behind the band for a start, you know, the old uh, tradition of marching behind the band, which was something I always dreamed about anyway as a, as a player. My two brothers had played for Derry, and, uh, and Leo, in fact, was 18 when he was uh, uh, subbed for Derry in the 1958 All-Ireland Final. My mother took me to the game. That was my first taste of uh, Croke Park. It breaks this time, kindly for Tony McAtee, there's an opportunity! Oh, what a chance of a goal! And it fell to Stevie McDonnell! And it was Conor Gormley who denied Armagh a levelling up goal in a dramatic finish! I enjoyed it immensely that day, but I have to say that enjoyment was really shared by my wife and, uh, and two daughters who, although both born in Ireland, have lived uh, exactly about a week of their lives in Ireland, um, and um, uh, they came over. Uh, they just couldn't believe the occasion. I mean, they've, they've been brought up um, really in an, a soccer environment, but well aware of the roots, and, um, and came here to experience uh, an occasion like, like they hadn't experienced before. On Monday, September the 29th, 2003, for the first time in 119 years, Tyrone senior football team were welcomed home as All-Ireland champions. For Tyrone supporters, the victory was extra special because in the final, they had beaten their next door neighbours, Armagh. It was unique too because, thanks to the backdoor system, two northern teams had contested the match at Croke Park. In fact, three of the four semi-finalists in the 2003 competition were from Ulster. For two years running, Northern teams have won the National League and the All-Ireland Senior Final. But why are sides from the North doing so well? What factors are contributing to the phenomenon of the men behind Maguire? For four weeks in September 2003, Armand Trelone prepared for the mother of all battles. Appropriately, national schools got caught up in the frenzy. Most of this year's All-Ireland finalists had been introduced to GAA in their early school years. The typical career path is through underage teams, to minors, then under 21s, right through to full senior level. Well, well little doubt that um, the, the structures we have here at schools level you know, have been the platform uh, to success at, at county level, um, county minor, under 21 and senior level. Um, the teachers up here spend a, an awful amount of time with their with their pupils after school, dinner time after school, um, coaching, encouraging them, bringing them on, developing their skills, and that's I think that's very evident when, when they go on to minor and under 21 level. Um, I don't honestly know if, if the same work is going on in in the other provinces. I, w I would doubt it. The primary schools in this country are doing very little physical education of any consequence. Never mind Gaelic games, they're not doing any physical education of any consequence. So I think certainly that's a detriment to all games as well. I mean, the teachers of this country put so much into our organisation down the years. That was the reason why the Kerrys, the Dublins, the Galways, the Corks, all the good counties down south here were achieving so much because of the amount of work that the Christian Brothers and the teaching fraternity of this country were putting in. But that's no more. So I think it's about time now that the organisation here in the south really got down to it and they'll have to send coaches into primary schools and get to work on it quickly. In the north of Ireland, I think they're better organised in that line. I don't know exactly what way the other counties work, but I know that in, say, my own club and other clubs in Armagh, we have great people who, who work with the children and introduce them to 
uh, to our national game, and that's where the love of all these things start. Uh, I know we can have maybe 200 children a week up in the field across Midland, and I'm sure other clubs can tell the same stories. The idea is that if you work with your young people and uh, give them good opportunities to be aware of good practice, um, then that will stand to them wherever they go. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good way to begin, and Tyrone have been good at that. Uh, at schools level, both the, the grammar schools and the vocational schools, They've been able to hold their head high now, take on anyone in the country and not feel in awe of them. And they have been very successful in both codes at, at the grammar school level and in the uh, vocational sector. So it's good, it's good to work with the young, good to give them that sense of confidence and I think it has brought us on a long way. The nurturing begins at national schools. In villages like Ballon Derry, home of the 2002 All-Ireland Club Champions. It continues at second and third level colleges and in the network of clubs. On a January afternoon, the Queen's <laughs> University football squad disregards the bitter cold and the exam season to go training. At sessions like this, the emphasis is on refining mental as much as physical toughness. All our players ha have been put on, on a, a gym session throughout the whole winter that they do become physically stronger. But this goes back to uh, from underage, the training that young kids should be doing, how they, sh they, they talk about core, core stability exercises. This is improving the body from, from 14, 15 right up, that you're not brought onto a county team and all of a sudden you're doing these weights weight sessions and building up muscle. It starts at an earlier age and we're lucky that a lot of our players have been doing this type of stuff and probably we are ahead of other counties down south in what we've done. It didn't happen over two years. This has been a steady growth over the last four or five years the way these boys have done that and now they have so much in the tank it's only a matter of tapping up every now and again. But at the end of the day you can be the, the, the most physical person in Ireland and the fastest person in Ireland if you haven't got the ability to go with these things and want to work as a team, you know, you won't win anything. You had the Kerry and Dublin dominance of the 70s and further on, and then Meath came into the, the frame and that, and Ulster teams fell behind for so many years they didn't win in Ireland at all. So maybe we had to decide to work harder, and often that happens when you're second best. You have to think more about what you're doing. And I do believe that there is a lot of effort put in now to total preparation. It's not just about football and football talent, it's about preparing the person for the challenge of what Gaelic Games is nowadays. To compete at this level, you've got to dedicate yourself completely because the Northern players were always gifted footballers and perhaps maybe, maybe the occasional uh, side attraction maybe diverted their attention away. You could you'd say lots of things, but I, I, I'm from the North. My belief, and always has been, and um, sometimes they'll find it, is that, um, that we have got the most talented players going. And it was just a matter of time before they, they, they pulled together. They decided to do away with the uh, distractions of it and go for it really big time. And um, I'm delighted to see that, uh, that uh, Derry, Donegal, Armagh and now Tyrone have done that. We have a dietitian. Uh, you know, I mean, people might think you're eating properly, but you, you certainly aren't. We have looked at, uh, at uh, professional setups like soccer and, and rugby. I think there'd be a greater link between rugby and Gaelic football now than ever there was before. Because you can see the way rugby has moved on on a worldwide stage that the fitness levels and the physique of rugby players now is probably better than ever before. We we'll begin these areas you're talking about, lifestyle. And you must have young people aware of lifestyle and the value of living a solid life. And then uh, the fitness levels, you have to be careful here as well because there's a, the whole talk about burnout now as well. So it's about managing their time and managing their training. And it's about young people being able to give of their best to whichever team is in need of their ability at any given time. It's the core or the centre of their life. I mean, it was epitomised me. I saw a newspaper headline. It was epitomised Oshin McConville, who played for Armagh this year, where I saw a newspaper headline where he had an injury during the year and he considered giving up his job so that he could get it right. I mean, that's taking it to, to great extremes. 
Um, you often hear of players maybe not being able to continue playing for many years or extra years or years into their 30s because of their family commitments or their work commitments. But here we had a situation where it was the opposite. They, they couldn't continue their, their normal job almost because they wanted to get everything so perfect for, for, their, for their football, which is a great platform for a manager or a management uh, for motivation if, if that intense hunger is there among the players. The inter-county rivalry within Ulster is intense. No quarter is asked or given when neighbours meet. The McKenna Cup and the National League are the preamble, but the real event is the Ulster Championship. I mean, a Kilray versus Bullachie, or Kilray versus Newbridge, or Newbridge versus Bullachie, and New Newbridge versus Bullearn were just maybe about the dirtiest games you'd ever seen in your life. And uh, they, those were for real men, for the rest of us, we just decided to, to sit out. That those are the days when you wanted to be a substitute and, and hopefully never get on. There isn't any other single province where every county at the beginning of their championship campaign would seriously believe that they can win the provincial title. That is the fact in Ulster, and everyone has good reason to believe that. So we have nine counties in Ulster, and every one of them believe at the start of the season that they can be Ulster champions. So there is a very competitive nature in our provincial championship. And that being so, those who come through that championship, and if anybody comes through the qualifying system out of Ulster as well, they will be a confident side, they will believe that they're as good as anyone else in the country, and with the recent history of two All-Irelands, Armagh and Tyrone, that will not take from that confidence. So I do believe that there's an ability there to be up with the best. Somebody's going to come up with some new plays, and, and they're going to be the way to go in a few years' time. You know, we know it's not going to last forever, but as long as we can, you know, keep adding to what we've done and keep ourselves ahead of the posse, we, that means we have a chance of winning another all in and that's all we're here to do. Beside the famous pitch of Cross Midland Rangers in County Armagh, the British Army coexists with the local GAA club. It is an imperfect relationship. On the day Armagh played Tyrone for the Sam Maguire, Two PSNI officers agreed to be filmed watching the match. This was newsworthy because it was a sign of changing times. When victorious Tyrone returned as All-Ireland champions, they crossed the border at Ochnacloy, where 15 years before, Aidan McInesby was shot and killed at a British Army checkpoint on his way to GAA training. No other province has this complex mix of politics, sport, and nationalism. On the day of the All Ireland final, Tyrone used Out on the Vian, a soldier's song, to cement their team bond. When the game was over and they had won, they closed the door in the dressing room and sang it again. Sometimes during the National Anthem your mind can wander a bit. Um, you're worrying about the opposition, you're worrying about how well you're going to play yourself. So I think it was Mickey's idea really to let, let everybody be uh, in sync about one thing, that right, we'll, we'll sing it together, we'll uh, keep focused that way, that we're a team that we can hear one another singing, we'll stand shoulder to shoulder close to one another and uh, let's belt it out. And that uh, unity remains there, that bond is still very evident for the, those couple of minutes that the National Anthem is on. Plus, it's something that everybody should know anyway, so uh, he done us all a favour. Certainly in the North, there has been a very strong identification uh, between the nationalist Catholic community and the Gaelic a Athletic Association, stretching back over many decades. So, so it is something of great importance in the lives of individuals and in the lives of local communities. And in fact, you know, I would contend for, for many people outside of their faith and their, their religion, uh, the, the GAA is the next uh, most important thing right up there with uh, their political uh, beliefs. 
a few of the nights we were down in the in the City West Hotel, and uh, Mickey got his daughter Michaela in, who's, who's learning Irish in St Mary's College, and uh, our own folk artist and Mickey Coleman to help out and to, to lead the, the rest of the boys in singing it. And I'm sure the residents in the City West, city west were, were wondering at times what number God going on here when they could hear uh, the group of minorities belting out the, the national anthem in a room beside them. But uh, it was fun at the time, but it was something that everybody took serious and it's something everybody wanted to do probably anyway. And uh, if you'd speak to most of the boys, they'd probably tell you that they'd be somewhat embarrassed that they didn't know the words of it in the first place. I think the peace process has been also a liberating factor because uh, it is now uh, you know, much easier to be involved in the GA and not to have to worry about going through checkpoints and the harassment and huge difficulties that uh, GA uh, players and participants have to endure on their way to football matches or uh, training sessions. I think also that there is, uh, if you like, a newfound confidence as well, that there's a great sense of belonging within the Nationalist Republican community vis-a-vis uh, -vis belonging to the rest of the island and, and feeling part of a, an all-Ireland uh, political situation, culture. Uh, and the Gaelic Athletic Association is a national uh, organisation. I remember visiting Balahi a number of years ago and they, they were playing in an Ulster Club Championship. I was actually staying with the, with the Diamond family and visited the pitch on that afternoon when the, con when the Ulster Club Championship was on. And just listening even to the announcements uh, for the coming week and the activities were on, there was something on every night in the clubhouse or on the pitch, not all connected with Gaelic games, but community meetings and so on. So, you know, it, 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 for the first time it struck me greatly that the whole involvement of the community and all the various parts of the community was around that GA pitch and that clubhouse. And that obviously grows and gets to players and young players and uh, that they are, if you like, when they do put in the work and do put in the extra training and so on, that they are the centre of the attention in their community. Uh, and maybe there's less distractions in many ways than there is in other parts of the country. Michael Lawler, they're moving it well now, leash into their stride. The journey to Croke Park Mr. produced Mr. a court of casualties and controversy. Video evidence got Gavin Devlin a 12-week suspension for a foul in the National League final in May. He returned for the two decisive matches of the season. The Ulster Championship was keenly contested. High tension, some sublime passages of football, and no shortage of what are euphemistically called competitive exchanges. Tyrone got major scares from Down and Derry and needed a replay to beat each of them. Armagh lost out to Monaghan. When they re-entered the competition through the back door, it was clear they weren't going to roll over without a fight. In the quarter-final, they rough a leash by staying in the dressing room for several minutes after half-time. The reigning champions then met the Romantics' choice, Donegal in the semi-finals. Ran at the heart of defence, took the hits that Armagh gave him. I know there's three people injured on the field at the moment, but what a finish down to the corner. Brian McAniff's team had them on the ropes, but despite wayward shooting, dogged Armagh saw off Donegal in the closing minutes. Those who predicted a bust-up final between Tyrone and Armagh were disappointed. In fact, when Jermot Marsden was harshly dismissed, he walked off with dignity. No quarter asked, none given. Are they dirty? Are they hard? How would you describe them? It's a physical, it's a physical game. I think another dimension that's coming to Gaelic games, probably being led by Ulster at the minute, is the strong uh, tackling. Uh, it's a very thin line. And, Certain interpretations this year would have suggested that they were just on the wrong side of that line. I still hold reserve judgment on that. I think that uh, I think that they're again they're 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 they have gone into very technical detail, for instance, on how you can tackle players and surround players and so on. I I I, I don't I I don't think 
uh, that we can get to a situation where we say that, that it's foul play. I think we, you're going to see a situation in the next coming, the, the couple, few next years where we're going to have a stronger type of player playing the game at vital areas in the pitch anyway, who, who can, if you like, um, give and take those kind of tackles. If there was one sequence that defined Tyrone's season, it came during the All-Ireland semi-final against Kerry. Before a packed Croke Park, hope and history clashed. The aristocrats of football were pummeled like rag dolls and brushed aside. To some, this was the perfect expression of a new form of power game. To others, it was puke football. People called it blanket defence, called it nearly negative play. I don't believe that for one minute. I believe it was intense, and it had to be intense, but it was intense within the rules of the game. Not one Kerry player had to leave that field injured because of something that a Rome player did. And, and, and really, if anything was injured or, 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 or dented, it was their pride. And that's understandable because they're a very proud county and a very proud tradition. And uh, a lot, a lot of All-Irelands, I would love to have half as many as they have. But on that particular day, we actually performed better than Kerry did, and it was intense, and we're very happy about that. Certainly, the, the, the fitness level of the Tyrone players was unbelievable. I think the Kerry players were releasing the ball quicker, maybe, and faster, and maybe the Kerry players could have been a little fitter, maybe, than they were on the day. I don't want to be commenting on what preparation they did or anything like that, but it looked like as if Kerry weren't really on top of their toes that day, whereas Don or uh, Tyrone were absolutely flying. And I mean, the point of those is that they were able, to, their work rate around the pitch was unbelievable. But I mean, you can't stop that. I mean, it's up to every other county to bring up the level of fitness in their teams. And I think if there's a more direct game of football played against maybe that system, you, you can counteract it. When everybody runs an All-Ireland, they say it's a dream come true, but um, so all your dreams come true as, as far as I was concerned and a, a lot of the other players, they like so Chris Lawn because Football is something that we've, that's in our blood, that we've been reared on, basically. And it's something that means uh, the world to us. And um, um, consider the amount of effort, the amount of time that you put into the game, the amount of time you spend uh, away from your family, um, away from your work and whatnot. You know, it's, it is far more than just a game. Would you prefer to play beautifully as others would see it, and lose, or play competently, robustly, but win? Mm -hmm. Absolutely the latter. <laughs> losing is a very, very bad feeling, you know, and I would prefer to have a winning feeling than a losing feeling. After September this year, you know, it was so disappointing. But it, after a few days, you know, we sat back and we looked at it and we said, right, we're not that far away, we know we can go again, and hopefully we'll be there at our best next year. The thought of winning drives you on, the fear of losing also drives you on. I was asked a couple of years ago what I wanted me epitaph to be and I just said that it was uh, Peter Canavan, a uh, member of the first throne team to win an all Ireland title. So I'm very happy with that. Sam is north of the border now, being fated in a land familiar with the philosophy, what we have, we hold. Tyrone are all Ireland champions. Armagh and the rest of Ulster are hurting. The first phase of battle begins again with the National Football League. The days are beginning to lengthen. The Ulster Championship beckons. Mick O'Dwyer, the most successful manager in modern history, saw his leash team beat Armagh in the league last year. He believes they'd have done so in the championship too, 
until they lost their momentum in this incident. And from a position where Leash were attacking, they now have conceded a free kick. John O'Mahony's Galway were the last team to win the Sam Maguire before the trophy was spirited north. O'Mahony, O'Dwyer and 21 other managers are now plotting to end Ulster's dominance. I'm not going to even think about the northern systems or what way they prepared our teams. I, I have no intention of doing that, good, bad or indifferent. I'm going to prepare a team my way and I'm hoping that I can produce a team that will certainly put up a good show. I think we gave our ma a very, very good game in the, in the quarter-final of the championship this year. They only beat us by two points, 15-13. We beat them in the National League semi-final. So, I mean, I'm not too worried about their systems in the north at all, I can assure you. I'll work mine, and well, if it's good enough, it'll be good enough, and if not, maybe then we'll have to change. I think that the style of play of Ulster, which is very effective, uh, and particularly by Tyrone and Armagh, um, of a defensive type football which is executed very clinically and very uh, efficiently uh, won't, now that teams have, uh, have seen it and are used to it, will have to react tactically and I think, that, I have no doubt but that they will in the coming year so that it won't be as easy to execute maybe in the coming years as it was in the last couple of years. The Kerrys and Corks aren't going to lie down, Limerick's on the way up as well uh, over in Connacht, the Galway are always around, and Muscom and Sligo Mayo are going to be in there. Leinster has opened up again with Leash coming to the fore. Dublin, uh, you've got Kildare, you've got Louth, you've got Offaly, you've got Meath. You've got more counties who believe they can do it, uh, go and win in All Ireland. So, whereas, yes, there's a strength in Ulster at the moment, it would be foolhardy of all of us to think that we're on a roll and it's going to be like this forever, because life's not like that. And those who feel second best at any given time probably try harder. So we have to be on our yard. The worst moment was on the 28th of September this year. And the, 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 the best moment was September last year when we won our first all in. It's as simple as that. A very important change has occurred where people are now saying to themselves, well, we can be as good as anybody else. We can produce players of as high a calibre as Kerry can produce, or Dublin can produce, uh, and have produced in the past, and, and we can go on to win uh, all Ireland. And I think, you know, for many decades that self-belief just wasn't there, and many uh, Ulster teams turned up in competitions, particularly against teams from Leinster and from Munster, uh, with almost the uh, outcome being predictable that that they were there to make up the numbers and, and not really expected to. Uh, to win championships. Those days are gone and, and I believe that those days are, are gone forever. On a winter's night in the West Tyrone village of Pomeroy, the county's under 15 footballers gather. Lined up to meet them is a team of experts. Self-discipline is the one thing that has set you ways apart. Lifestyle management, diet, video analysis, sports psychology, the moulding of minds goes on. Anyone who believes Ulster dominance on GAA fields will be short-lived should take note. On the night that Sol won the All-Ireland semi-final, Darren Clark from Dungan won a million dollars in America. On a Monday morning there wasn't one person in Dungan talking about Darren Clark, but they're all talking about Tyrone. And our lad didn't win anything, probably cost them money to be there. That's the difference with the success that comes with being part of a team as opposed to an individual. I was trained by Sean O'Neill from Down, right, when I was played Sigurds in Football at Queen's. And it suddenly dawned on me, Down won with the first team to take a Sam Maguire across the border in 61, right? Never been done since partition in 1922, it never had happened. You can imagine how we felt for about 15, 20 years here because it hadn't come since, say, 68 when Down won it last. They had never won it, nobody had won it. And Down had no tremendous tradition in football at the time. And he used to say to us when we were going down to the Sigurds in Dublin, he says, we're going down the rocky road to Dublin, and we're going to walk into this pitch as if we bought and paid cash for it. Right? We're not going to walk in as second-class citizens. We're going to walk in as if we own this place. And then I suddenly realised that this was why Down was able to do that. And you will be the same, and we all have to be the same whenever you, if you get to that level and you're going into the Lake of Coke Park. You believe in it. The crossbar... The high jump bar, or whatever you want to call it, has now been increased even more. You're going to have to, you know, when you're playing for the county, 
unless you win a senior, another all Ireland, you're not going to be as good as the team from the Peter Cannon's team in 2003. You know, and that's, that's, that's what you're going to be judged on by now. So we are victims of our own success in some, in some cases, but it's still the only place to be. There are three types of people. There's the boys who make it happen, there's the boys who watched it, watch it happen, and there's the boys who wonder what happened. Now you lads, the way you've gone to date, you are all going to be one of the first two. You are capable of being lads who make it happen, or capable of being lads who watch it happen. I don't believe you as the sort of boys who wondered what happened. But it's up to you yourselves to, de to decide what those two groups will be in. On and on, the fine tuning continues. Advice offered, notes taken, the concept of the group reinforced. The message from Pomeroy is the same one delivered at Croke Park for the last two Septembers. For a variety of complex reasons, Ulster GAA has a formula and a hunger. The result is an assembly line. Boys razor keen to become the next generation of men behind Maguire. A lethal terror. Leaves inside have more room to move. Mm. So each bag is like a mini teapot, giving you the best cup of Lion's Original ever. Here, Maggie, apparently these pyramid bags are so good because there's more room for the tea leaves to move. Move? I didn't realize you knew the meaning of the word, Tom. <sighs> New Lion's Original Pyramid Bags for our best cup ever. Can Dove take coloured hair that has become dry and brittle and revive it? We asked some women to try it themselves. When the cameras follow a colourful legend of Gaelic football, we find out what happened when Paddy O'Shea swapped green and gold for maroon. October 2003 in Westmeath, a tranquil county and footballing backwater, but that's about to change. The new manager of the Westmeath football team, Paddy O'Shea. <laughs> Paddy O'Shea has won 10 All-Irelands as player and manager. Westmeath have never won anything at senior level. They make an odd and interesting couple, but Paddy's mind is still on an old love. The previous week, Pawdy was sacked from the Kerry manager's job. At home in Ventry, he's hurting badly, feeling bemused by his dismissal. If you're somebody that the last thing I think about before going to bed is football and Kerry, and the first thing I think about in the morning when I wake up is football and Kerry, and that I've been doing that since I knew what a football looked like. 
nothing meant more to me than the green and gold.